Okay, class today is Friday, January the 20th. This is pre-AP chemistry. Today we're going to be talking about chemical nomenclature. Last couple of weeks we've been talking about bonding and how atoms come together with an ionic bond where they transfer electrons. They come together where uh, they share electrons in a covalent bond. And so we've learned how to draw the Lewis dot structure and state the shape and determine whether it's polar or nonpolar and the type of intermolecular forces holding the molecules together and how that affects the boiling points and the melting points. So now we need to just get down to some of the simple basics of, well, how do we name these? How do we write the formulas for these compounds when they do bond? How do we know how many are going to come together? Okay, how do we know? I mean, we draw the Lewis structure, but the formula was always given. How do we know what that formula is going to be? And so we want to talk today about chemical nomenclature. How do we name compounds and, and how do we write these formulas? And so um, the first thing that we need to do, and, and by the way, everything that I'm giving to you, all these notes that are on the board, it's going to be really kind of hard to see with the video. I know the quality is not that great. Um, and so uh, these notes are all on Classroom for you, and so you can look those up and hopefully you have them with you uh, right now. I don't think you can split the screen. Uh, to be able to see both me and the notes at the same time, but um, you probably want to, uh, hopefully maybe you printed these out, but you, you, these are available to you, so you need to follow along. These are going to be very helpful for you. So first off, when we write a chemical formula, when we say H2O, you need to understand that that's going to show us the kind of number of atoms in the smallest representation you know the substance, okay? So for a covalent molecular substance, the smallest part is a molecule, so we use the molecular formula. Okay, that's what we're most likely, that's what we're most common to see, H2O. That's the formula of the actual molecule of water. Okay, CO2 is the actual individual molecule of water. C6H12O6, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. That's the number of atoms combining together. Now, we do need to know that when we have that, that we have C6, H12, O6, that this is these smaller numbers here, these are all called subscripts. Subscripts. And they tell us the number of atoms in the molecule. So we have six carbon atoms, we have 12 hydrogen atoms, and we have six oxygen atoms in each molecule. Okay? Now, you need to be specified, so we, here if we say H2, this is equal to two hydrogen atoms bonded together. Whereas 2H equals two individual not bonded hydrogen atoms. So if I put a two out in front of this molecule here, that means I'm going to have two glucose molecules. The coefficient, this is a coefficient here, just like in math, a coefficient. Okay? This tells us how many molecules we have. The subscripts tells us how many atoms are in each molecule. I think you probably already know that, but I just wanted to clarify. I'm going to move the camera to get a little bit better angle of all of that. So let's just see here. So, oh, come back to me. Find me. I'm over here. All right. So the coefficient tells us how many molecules. The subscripts tell us how many of each. So in a covalent molecular substance, we use a molecular formula. That tells us the exact number of atoms in the molecule. It does not have to be the simplest ratio. For instance, even on this one, glucose, obviously that could be reduced to 1 to 2 to 1. But the molecule exists, C6H12O6. If you look at octane, the gasoline, C8H18, that is not reduced, but that's the way the molecule actually exists. Hydrogen peroxide, the stu stuff you put on your bobos when you cut yourself, okay? And so um, H2O2, yes, I know I say bobos, okay, but you say boo-boos, but boo-boo is the bear on Yogi Bear, okay? So it, it's a cut, it's a scrape. So H2O2, molecular compounds, you get to use the molecular formula. It doesn't have to be the simplest ratio. Now, it can be, like water, 
the molecule is the simplest ratio, two to one. That, that, that's the way it is. So as many covalent compounds, carbon dioxide, CO2, that's the simplest ratio, and that's the way the molecule actually exists. But it doesn't have to be. Okay? Whereas in ionic compounds, we, call, we use what's called the empirical formula or formula unit. That's just the, whole, the lowest whole number ratio. Because if you recall, you just took the test yesterday, that ionic compounds don't form molecules. They form these large crystal structures where positive surrounded by negative, surrounded by positive, surrounded by negative, surrounded by positive. So there's no real molecule. So all we can do is give the simplest ratio. Well, what's the ratio of the ions in that crystal? And so we call that the empirical formula or the simplest ratio. Empirical means simple. And so um, we, in an ionic compound, you're going to have some polyatomic ions. We're going to talk about those later. That's what the chart up on the wall is, the, the many atom ions. They're bonded together. They carry a charge. Okay? Uh, in ionic compounds, when a metal is attached to an OH, we call it a base. And when we attach it to all other ionic compounds, we just call it salts. Okay, those are just old school names. All of these are going to use ionic or empirical formulas because they're all ionic. Okay, so if you have a polyatomic ion involved, even if it's a base or any other ionic compound, we're going to use the empirical formula to describe it, the simplest ratio. And we'll, we'll be talking about these two things. Okay, so this is for ionic compounds. This is for covalent compounds. Metals are elements, and so we won't worry about the, the formula for metal. So we're really just going to be focusing on these two right here. But before we can really get into naming and writing formulas, we have to understand this thing called oxidation numbers. Now I need to go move the screen up. Let me get bigger. Okay, so what we need to do now is look at how do we calculate these oxidation numbers. We're going to be using these oxidation numbers in order to be able to write the formulas. Okay, so the definition of an oxidation number is the number of electrons an atom tends to gain, lose, or share when forming a chemical bond. When we looked up at the periodic table and you see the alkali metals and we say it's going to form a charge of plus one, that's talking about it's going to lose one electron because it wants to be the same electrons as the noble gases. Or we look at the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine. We know that they want to gain one electron to be the same electron configuration as the halogens. So they're going to be a minus one. Oxygen family wants to be a minus two. But that's all talking about gaining and losing electrons. When we get into covalent bonding, we're going to be sharing electrons. And that's where oxidation state really is more important because for ionic compounds, the oxidation state and the charge is pretty much the same thing, so there's not much difference there. But when you get into covalent compounds, they're not transferring electrons, not really gaining and losing, they're sharing electrons. So we want to know how many electrons are involved in sharing. And that sometimes varies as, as the molecules bond, and we're going to look at that. So there, these are seven rules because we're going to have to determine these oxidation numbers in covalent compounds and be able to figure that out so when we go to name the compounds, we, we know what they are. So the first thing is, and this is an important one, is any element, if it's an element, oxygen, nitrogen, silver, gold, aluminum, it's not going to have an oxidation number. They're not gaining or losing electrons. They're zero. Their charge is zero. Elements are neutral. So we always say the oxidation state of any element is just zero. It hasn't gained, lost, or shared anything. It's not until they start combining together are they going to gain, lose, or share. So elements are always zero. This is what I just said earlier. Oxidation number of ions, monatomic ions, chlorides, sodium, Na+, uh, Mg2+, any of those ions, the oxidation state, the charge, it's the exact same thing, so there's really not that much difference. So we don't need to worry about that. Now, number three is very important. This is how we're going to know how many of each thing to put because the sum of the oxidation numbers is always going to have to equal zero. So this is one of the most important rules right here, so we really need to know this. Now, in order to be able to figure this one out, we have to know four and five are just the generalities. Hydrogen is almost always plus one. Now, if you look at rule six, 
Rule six says the more electronegative element is negative and the less electronegative element is positive. That's how we determine which one's positive, which one's negative. And if you recall, you look up again on the periodic table, metals always have the low electronegativity. Nonmetals have the high electronegativity. So metals are going to be your positive, your nonmetals are going to be your negative uh, oxidation states because of electronegativities. So hydrogen, it's way over there on the left. But its electronegativity is right in the middle, 2.2, .2, on a scale from 0 to 4. But when it combines with almost any other nonmetal, it's the less electronegative element, so it's going to be plus 1. So almost always, hydrogen is plus 1. But every once in a while, it'll combine with an active metal. An active metal is one like an alkali metal, or even an alkaline earth metal, group 1 or group 2. Those are low electronegative elements. So in those rare cases, hydrogen is the more electronegative element. So hydrogen actually becomes minus one. And so any minus ion, we're going to learn in just a little bit, any minus ion is always going to end in IVE, so it's called the hydride ion. When it's plus one, we just call it the hydrogen ion. But when it's minus one, it's the hydride. All minus, one ion, all minus ions that are just one atom are in an IVE. And we're going to, again, we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay? Oxygen is almost always minus two. There's a rare case when it's called a peroxide, when it bonds with itself. Hydrogen peroxide. If you recall when we were doing Lewis dot structures, we always said we build like sulfur, H2SO4. We put the sulfur, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. We build the oxygens around, okay? And then we put in all the dots. Okay? But all the oxygens build around the sulfur. But in a peroxide, H2O2, the, hydro the oxygens bond to themselves. This is what makes it a peroxide. It's an O2 with a 2 minus charge. When you have the oxygen single bonded to itself, that's when you get a peroxide. Now, it's, it's, it's rare, it's reactive. Now, hydrogen peroxide is, again, the stuff you buy and, and for your cuts and your scrapes, and, you, and it always comes in an amber bottle because the sunlight it gives enough energy to break this bond. It wants to decompose just back into water and oxygen gas because that's a much better thing, so then it's not bonded to itself. So it says always on the bottle, store in a cool, dark place. So they put it in an amber bottle, and really, you should put it into the refrigerator especially assuming that the light really does go off when you close the refrigerator door. Still, I'm not 100% convinced, but if the light goes off, then it's a cool, dark place. That's really the best place to store the peroxide, but at least in a dark place and not out in the sun because it's going to decompose because that, double, that single bond oxygen is very unstable. That's a peroxide, but again, that's rare. So almost always, oxygen is minus two. Hydrogen is almost always plus one. So these are knowns here, okay? The more electronegative, we talked about that one. And then lastly, this one's important too. If you have just an ion, a polyatomic ion, say we have carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. Rule 7 says that the sum of the oxidation states of these is going to have to add up to minus 2. If it's a compound like H2O2, it adds up to 0. But if it's an ion, it's going to add up to the charge. So here's the question. How do you know if it's a compound or an ion? Well, what's the definition of an ion? Do you know? I'm sure you're screaming out loud to yourself. It's a, it's a charged particle. Ions have charges. Okay? So, if there's no charge written, it's zero. If a charge is written, it's an ion. If it's an ion, it has to have the charge written. So, we know oxygen is always minus two. So, minus two. But we have three oxygens, for that's going to be a total of minus six. Now, the sum has to add equal zero, so carbon is going to be plus four is the oxidation state of carbon because it has to add up to the charge. Okay? So, rule three, the sum oxidation number is always equal to zero. We're going to use that when we really get into writing formulas. This is going to be the key. When we have ions, it adds up to the charge on the ion. So, the oxidation numbers always add up to whatever you have. Now, if you look on the periodic table, the little black number above the symbol tells us the oxidation number for every element. Most only have one number. 
However, there are a bunch of the nonmetals have a variety of different oxidation states. For instance, chlorine can be plus or minus one, seven, five, or three. It can be all those. So what does that mean? Again, remember, it's most, impor it's most important for when we're sharing electrons. So let's look at some compounds of chlorine. Chlorine can form HCl. Okay? Now, HCl, if you look at chlorine, chlorine has seven valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron. So the hydrogen can come in here and bond like this and share that electron right there. So, since chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, chlorine is negative, hydrogen takes the positive oxidation state. Chlorine has one of its electrons involved in bonding. Therefore, it's minus one is its oxidation state. Hydrogen has one of its electrons, but it's the less electronegative, so it has to be plus one. So chlorine, that's the normal oxidation state. Chlorine means that, that minus one means it's got one electron involved in bonding. It did not take this. It doesn't have a charge of minus one. If it had a charge, that's when the sign comes afterwards. So ions, we say where there's actually a transfer of electrons has an actual charge, we would say one minus. But because it's minus one, that just means it's a sharing. That's how many electrons that are involved in bonding. It's just one. Now there's another compound, H. CLO. Now remember, when we write compounds, hydrogen and oxygen, well, they kind of have a thing for one another. Okay? So as a result, the hydrogen is going to be on the, even though it's written like this, the hydrogen is going to be on the oxygen. So chlorine, again, has seven valence electrons. You put your oxygen in there with its six valence electrons, and you can put your hydrogen here. So when we want to look at oxidation states, Chlorine has seven valence electrons, but only one is involved in bonding. Just this one right here. Since oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine, and you can find those values on the back of your periodic table, oxygen gets the negative. Chlorine has to be plus one in this case. Oxygen has its two electrons involved in bonding. It gets to be minus two. And hydrogen has its one. It's less electronegative, so it's plus one. But notice, they all add up to zero. So the oxidation state is telling us how many of the electrons of each element are involved in bonding. But we can actually kind of do that just looking at the compound. Here we know it has to equal zero. Hydrogen is always plus one. Oxygen is almost always minus two. So to get it to equal zero, this has to be plus one. But that means that there's one electron involved in bonding. That's what that oxidation state is. It's not a charge. It didn't lose one electron. It's just that somebody has involved in bonding. It's positive because oxygen is more electronegative. Now there's another compound, HClO2. You have two oxygens. So we do kind of the same thing. We start off the same way. Chlorine with its seven valence electrons. Whoops. Leave that one blank. Bring the oxygen in with its six. I want to leave that one blank. And then bring the hydrogen in right there. But now, there's another oxygen. Now, oxygen does this unique, crazy thing. It since it has six electrons, it wants to bond with anything and everything in any way it can. And so, as a result, the oxygen's electrons will shift, and the six electrons will go here, and will actually share the pair of electrons from the chlorine. Now, an electron is an electron is an electron. There's still a one shared pair of electrons between the two atoms, so it's a normal single covalent bond. Okay? But now we end up having how many of chlorine's electrons are involved in bonding? It's three. Devin Irvin, Rachel Blackman, Clay Christian, Kaylee Booth. Please come to the front desk. So chlorine has three of its electrons involved in bonding now. Christopher Kirkman, Asia Bradley. Jennifer Bruce, Sam Johnson, please come to the office. So again, if we want to kind of keep the hydrogen has its plus one, oxygen is its minus two, times two is minus four. We know it has to equal zero. So chlorine in this case again is plus three. Three electrons involved in bonding. Yeah, the oxygen, I know it's kind of crazy. Oxygen gets credit for these two. It kind of gets double counted. Oxygen gets credit for the two. Chlorine gets credit for those two. But it talks about how many electrons are involved in bonding. Now, there's another compound, 
HClO3. Now the exact same thing, you do the same thing, but now we have to put a third oxygen on here. Well, we do the same thing we did on this one. We just put the oxygen here with the oxygen six electrons. So now chlorine has one, two, three, four, five electrons involved in bonding. And so chlorine, again, plus one. Oxygen is minus two. You have three of them, so it's minus six. Always has to add up to zero. So chlorine is in the plus five oxidation state. And then lastly, there's HClO4. Well, again, we need to put one more oxygen on here, so we do the exact same thing. We can just put the oxygen right here, HClO4. Now, all seven of chlorine's electrons are involved in bonding. So as a result, chlorine's in the plus seven oxidation state. All seven electrons. So these, these oxidation states aren't saying really a charge that's on the atom. Instead, it's saying how many electrons are involved in bonding. Okay? So when we look there, then these electrons that are involved in bonding, that's so one, three, five, seven. So when you look up here for chlorine, it can be plus or minus one, three, five, and seven. So that's not, it can only have those possible oxidation states really when it combines with oxygen. Chlorine is more electronegative than just about every other element. Only fluorine and oxygen are more electronegative than uh, chlorine. So chlorine is going to be minus one when it combines with just about anything. Only in this rare case does it, can it be this. But it's a possibility, so they put the number on the periodic table. But generally, we can know the halogens are minus one. The oxygen family is going to have a basically a minus two charge and a nitrogen family a minus three. But when the, those elements combine with oxygen, because the oxygen can share these lone pair like this, then you can bond in a variety of different ways. It can have a variety of different oxidation states. Okay? So... Kaylee Booth, Clay Christian, please come to the front desk. So we're really just talking about the number of electrons gained, lost, or shared in a chemical reaction. So we should be able to calculate the oxidation state. So let's practice, see if we can do it. So if I give this, say, the compound H2SO4, and we want to know what's the oxidation state of sulfur in this compound. Well, first off, I know it's a compound because there's no charge written here, so I know it has to add up to zero. Okay? Now, what do we say the, the, the oxidation state of hydrogen always is? Well, it's always plus one. Okay? What's the oxidation state of oxygen? Well, it's always minus two. So we got plus one, but there's two of them, so it's plus two. Oxygen is minus two, but there's four of them for a total of minus eight. So plus two and minus eight, what does sulfur have to be to make it equal zero? Well, hopefully you can see plus six. That means that sulfur has all six of its electrons involved in bonding. It doesn't lose six electrons. It just has six electrons being shared with the oxygen in all the bonds. If we did another compound, we could say H2 um, H2CrO4. And I want to know what's chromium's oxidation state in this. Well, hydrogen's plus one for a total of plus two. Oxygen's minus two, minus eight. It's going to be plus six. So you try now, while the announcements are going on, see if you can do in K M N O. Four. What is manganese oxidation number? What I would do is pause the video right now and see what you can do. Restart it once you get an answer. Okay. So if you look now, potassium is plus one. Oxygen is minus two times four is minus eight. It's a compound because there's no charge, therefore it has to equal zero. So, 
manganese must be plus 7. So we need to be able to figure out the oxidation numbers. Let's do one more that's kind of complicated. Okay, so copper nitrate. Okay. Copper can have several oxidation states, so we don't know which one it's going to be. So we got to figure it out. Well, we know that nitrate is minus one. Now, we're going to talk about that, too. We're going to memorize these. But Ooh, I hate announcements. But the nitrate, you look up here on the table, you see it's minus one is the charge. Since we have two of them, the total negative is minus two. Has to equal zero, so copper is plus two. But what's the nitrate in this? Well, to get nitrate... To get nitrate, you can pull it out and say NO3 minus. That's the charge on the ion. Well, the sub, well it has to add up. Don't, don't worry about the two. Just the NO3 minus, okay, they're going to both be the same. The two nitrates both be the same. So NO3 minus, we know now, this is rule seven, that it has to add up to the charge. So oxygen is minus two times three is minus six, has to equal minus one. So therefore, nitrogen is in the plus five oxidation state here. Yeah, normally it wants to be minus 3, but when it combines with oxygen, it's forced to be in the positive, and oxygen can do all that with the electrons, so things get crazy when it's combined with oxygen. If it's nitrogen with anything else other than oxygen, it's going to be minus 3. Okay? So, we should be able to calculate, we need to be able to calculate these oxidation numbers. You can read about that in your textbook. There's some practice that you can do in your textbook in Chapter 7, and so if, if you're still a little unclear, that would be a good thing to look at. All right, so now let's look at actually naming. Naming compounds, which is called nomenclature and writing formulas. So there are three types of compounds that we're going to try to name. We're going to have ionic compounds, which is a metal and a nonmetal. We're going to have covalent compounds, which is two nonmetals. And then we're going to have acids. And acids, the positive thing is always just going to be hydrogen. And we're going to look at how to do that. But we'll talk about that on Monday when uh, I come in. Today, we just really want to just finish up by talking about how do we name ionic compounds and then how do we write formulas for them. And so we've got about 15 minutes left, so we'll let, hopefully we can get through this. But... To name an ionic compound, first again, it's a metal with a nonmetal. We're going to name the cation first. Now, this is a great life lesson. Always be positive first. Whenever you have the chance, be positive first. Always wait until the last possible resort, last resort to go negative. Okay? So, life lesson, be positive first. Chemistry uh, mirrors and models that. So we're going to always name the positive first, the cation first. And that's going to be your metal. Metals lose, nonmetals gain. Okay? Now, if the transition, if the metal's a transition metal with more than one possible oxidation state, now how are we going to know that? Well, you have the periodic table that I gave to you. You're going to look. And so you go and you see scandium it has just one little number above it. It's just a three. So it only has one possible oxidation state, plus three. But titanium has two numbers, four and three. So it can be plus four or plus three. Vanadium has four numbers. Chromium has three. Manganese has five. So all of those transition metals, a lot of them have more than one possible oxidation state. So the way you're going to know is you're just going to have your periodic table out. You're just going to look. That's the way you're going to know. Okay? There's too many, the, the two crazy ones, that are to know which ones do and which ones don't. So you're never going to be expected to do that. You just look. But if it has more than one, we're going to have to give the name in Roman numerals because we say, well, which one is it? Because if you say iron chloride, well, it could be iron 2 chloride, it could be iron 3 chloride, it could be iron 6 chloride. Which, which, chlor, which iron is it? So the Roman numeral is going to tell us that. That's why we had to learn how to do oxidation numbers. because so we're going to have to figure out what's the oxidation state of the iron so then we can put that into the name. All right? So 
Once we get that, so we're going to name the cation first. So the only thing we have to worry about is Roman numerals. Does it have more than one oxidation state? Only some do. Most don't. Okay? Then we're going to name the anion last. Now the cation, the metals, the metals are easy though because it's just the name of the metal. So the Na plus is just sodium. Ca2 plus is just calcium. We don't change the name at all, even though it's an ion. And so we just name that. So the naming the first part is just the name from the periodic table. Anions always have one of three suffixes. Anions end in either id, ite, or eight. Those are the three suffixes. Ite and eight means it's going to be a nonmetal plus oxygen. Okay? I simply means it's going to be a nonmetal. Okay, so when we look at this, so you're on the periodic table, you see Cl minus, that's going to be the chloride ion. Chlorine, Cl is the element, Cl minus, chloride is the ion. F is fluorine, F minus is fluoride. Oxygen is O, O2 minus is oxide. Nitrogen is N, but N3 minus is going to be the nitride ion. Anytime you have just the nonmetal by itself, it's going to end in IDE. Now, there are two exceptions to that. Two exceptions. And those are written down a little bit farther down in the notes. The two exceptions are OH minus, which is a very common ion. It's called hydroxide ion. Okay? And then CN minus, which is the cyanide ion. And we had talked about that, the HCN. That's the gas they use in the gas chamber. Uh, that's what the poison pill is made out of with this cyanide, very poisonous. Okay? But these two end in I, but they're not monatomic. So how are you going to know that? Well, you just have to memorize those. The only way to know that is just to know it. But the rest of them, you can just look on the periodic table. You know by position on the periodic table. The halogens are always going to be minus one. The oxygen family is always minus two. The nitrogen family is always minus three. And it's just going to, if it ends in I, that means it's just the element by itself. Okay? You can have more than one of them but it's just one element. Now, if it ends in ite or eight, that means it's going to have some oxygens with it. So when we look up here, you can see that SO4 2 minus is sulfate. So the sulfite, the difference is, is just one less oxygen. SO3 2 minus. So the ite is always going to be one less. Nitrate is NO3 minus. Nitrite is NO2 minus. Phosphate is PO4, 3 minus. Phosphite is PO3, 3 minus. So the only difference between the 8 and the ite is one less oxygen. Now, we can know the charge of the ion by what family it's in. Because anything that has sulfur in it is going to be minus 2. With the phosphorus, it's going to be minus 3. With the halogens, it's going to be minus 1. So we can know the charge based upon what family the, the nonmetal is in. Not the oxygen, but the nonmetal. However, the number of oxygens, you just have to know. There's no way of knowing on that. You just have to know on the number of oxygens. Okay? So on Monday, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to give you a list. And yes, you are actually going to have to memorize and know that whole chart, but I'm going to show you how you're going to be able to figure that out. Okay? So the first thing you need to know is that if it's ite or eight, it has oxygen. The ite is always one less oxygen. Okay? Now, there is one other unique thing down there at D with chlorine. Chlorine forms not just two possibilities with the ions, but four. We can have ClO minus, ClO2 minus, ClO3 minus, and ClO4 minus. Well, we named this one chlorate. So one less oxygen than chlorate is going to be named chlorite. Okay, so A to night, that's normal, one less oxygen. But now this one has one more oxygen. So we have to put a prefix. We're out of suffixes. These are the only two possible suffixes for with oxygen. So this one has one more, or it's over, has, it's a higher oxidation state. So the prefix for that is hyper. So we say, but for some reason they took the high part off, and we just call it perchlorate. But it comes from hyper, like hyperactive kid is an overactive kid. Hypersensitive, you're very sensitive. This is perchlorate, that's over the chlorate. One more oxygen than the chlorate. And then 
the prefix for under, if you've ever had to go get a shot, you had to use a hypodermic needle, so it's a below the dermis, below the skin. Hypoglycemia means you have low blood sugar. So we're going to say hypochlorite. Now, I don't know why they don't take the high off of this one. They did here. Maybe they just don't want you to feel sorry for the chloride and just say, oh, pochlorite, you know. But it's hypochlorite, meaning below. So one below. Same charge, same everything, just one less oxygen. Now, the good news is, is that all the elements in a family bond the same way. So if we know this trend is true for the chlorates, that means that BrO4 minus is going to be per bromate. So what would IO4 minus be? Hopefully you're all screaming out per iodate. So then IO3 minus would be iodate, excuse me, iodate, IO2 minus is going to be one less oxygen than the eight, so it's going to be iodite. And then IO minus would be IO. No, not really. I'm just kind of getting a little goofy here. So it would be hypo iodite. Hypo iodide. So if you know one, so the bromine is going to do the same thing, the chlorine, all the elements in the same family are going to bond in the same way. So these are all minus one charges because everything in the halogens are minus one. Okay? So by knowing one, if we know chlorate, by knowing this one, that's the main common one, you can figure out really 12 more. You can figure out all the chlorines, all the bromines, all the iodines. They're all going to do the exact same thing. Ite is always one less oxygen than the eight. The hypoite is one less than the ite. And then the perate is one more than the eight. Every time. So you can do that. So by knowing one, you know 12. So you don't have to memorize all 12. You just know the rules and you memorize one. The same thing is true here. If you look at sulfate, it's SO4 2 minus. So then you go down right below it, selenium. So selenate is going to be SEO4 2 minus. Selenite is going to be SEO3 2 minus. Tellurium, you're going to have tellurate, TeO4, 2 minus, or tellurite, TeO3, 2 minus. And then if there's no oxygen, it's just Te2 minus, that's going to be telluride, which is also a famous ski slope out in Nevada or Colorado, somewhere out there. Um, it's somewhere that's a good ski slope, though. I've never been there, but I've heard it's pretty nice. Okay? So all the elements in the family bond the same way. Phosphate is PO4, 3 minus, so arsenate, just below it, arsenate is ASO4, 3 minus. Elements in the same family have the same number of valence electrons, so they all bond in the same way. Now, how then do we name things? Okay? We just got to put all this together. So if you understand how these ions are named, it makes learning them easier. So we're going to learn the ions. So in order to name the ionic compounds, you've got to name the cation first, anion last, but we need to know how they're named. So let's look at just some practice. We're going to finish up with this. So if we, want to, if we want to write formulas or name the compound from the formula, you look here in the positive, Na, that's sodium. So the positive, you don't ever change the name of the metal. The positive thing is just the name of the positive thing. So it's easy. So it's sodium. So you look on the periodic table, you see al sodium is an alkali metal. Well, there's only one possible oxidation state plus one for sodium, so we do not need a Roman numeral. So sodium, and then you see there's no oxygen here, so it's chlorine, but it's by itself, so it's going to end in ide. So sodium chloride. So there's only three ways they can end. It's either going to end in ide, ite, or eight. If there's no oxygen, it's going to be ide. If it's oxygen, it'll be ite or eight, and you have to kind of just memorize those. So you have calcium, 
And again, no oxygen, so it's just going to be fluoride. Don't worry about the two. Calcium is plus two, fluoride is minus one. There's only one way they can combine together. We don't need to say anything. So it's just going to be CAF2, calcium fluoride. Okay? Now, number three is going to be calcium. Then here, this is a polyatomic ion that you're just going to have to memorize the name. So, but for right now, you look up here on the chart, you find PO43 minus, and you see that it's phosphate. Again, you don't worry about the subscripts. You just name the cation first, the anion last. Calcium is an alkaline earth metal. It only has one possible oxidation state, so you do not need a Roman numeral. So you just name them, calcium phosphate. Now, on the other hand, now we come to iron, Fe. Now, iron is a transition metal, and you look at iron. Iron has three possible oxidation states. So when we're looking at that, then... Your, your irons, we have to figure out, well, what's the oxidation state then in FeCl2? Well, we know the chlorine is minus 1. There's two of them, minus 2 equals 0. So the iron must be plus 2. That's why we had to learn how to do oxidation states. So we can do this. So you have to put that in a Roman numeral. When iron, so we have to know, is it iron 2 or is it iron 3? So we have iron 2. The Roman numeral is always for the metal. Iron 2 chloride. All these nonmetals, by the way, they can only have one possible negative. That's the minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. The only time they're going to be positive is when they're the first thing, and so never when they're the last thing. So here, this is going to be, since it's minus 1, this is going to be iron 3 chloride. So you can't just say iron chloride because you wouldn't know which one of these two it is. So we have to use a Roman numeral to tell what's the oxidation state, what's the charge going to be. And this one's a little bit trickier. Okay, so it's going to be CuO and Cu2O. So again, there are compounds. There's no charge, so we know it equals zero. Oxygen is always minus two, so the total charge here has to be plus two. But we have two coppers, so each copper must be plus one. So the oxidation state is plus one for copper. So on this one, it's going to be copper one oxide, where here it's going to be minus two and plus two equaling zero. So this one is going to be copper two. The Roman numeral tells you the oxidation state, not the subscript. The oxidation state, not the subscript. Okay? So we're going to practice these. We'll practice these on Monday, but there's some in the book that you can look at to see how to name and, and do that if you want to kind of read and, and practice on your own. Okay? Now, let's just finish up by seeing, well, how do we write the formulas then? This is really pretty simple. Okay, just like... Just like in naming, positive goes first, negative goes last. And the whole key is that we have to make positive equal negative. So we're going to crisscross. Just like in math, when you need to get the lowest common multiple, you want to crisscross, cross multiply, because then you get, we need to make the positive equal the negative. So we look at barium chloride. So you write your formula over here. Barium is an alkaline earth metal, so we know it's plus two. Chloride's a halogen, so I know it's minus one. So I've got to make those equal to zero. So you just crisscross. So I need two chlorides, so I now I have a minus two and a plus two, it equals zero. Same thing, sodium oxide. Well, sodium is an alkali metal, it's a plus one. Oxygen is minus two, so I need two sodiums to get the plus two to equal the minus two. So Na2O is the formula, just crisscross. Magnesium sulfide. Magnesium is plus two, sulfur is minus two. Now, you don't crisscross here. We don't want Mg2S2 because these are ionic. Remember, we use empirical formula for an ionic compound, the simplest ratio. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Plus 2 minus 2 equals 0, so it's just MgS. Now, here, iron, we can't just say iron oxide because we don't know what's the charge going to be. So it has to have the Roman numeral. So this is telling me this is the charge on the iron. So iron is plus 3. Oxygen is minus 2. So what's the common multiple? How do I get them plus and minus to be equal? Well, cross multiply. Multiply this one by 2, this one by 3, you get plus 6 minus 6, so it's Fe2O3. If you have a polyatomic ion like calcium chlorate, 
First off, you look up here and you see chlorate is the ClO3 minus, and that's why we have to memorize it. Calcium is plus two. The whole chlorate is minus one. It's not just the oxygen. The whole thing is minus one. Okay? So we need three chlorates. So I have to put it in a parenthesis. Pardon me, I need two of them. It's plus two minus one. I need two chlorates, CaClO3, two. You only use a parenthesis when you need more than one polyatomic ion. Okay? And then lastly, ammonium. That's up here at the top. It's the only polyatomic uh, cation. Ammonium's plus one. Phosphate's minus three. So I need three of these positives to balance out the minus three. So I have to put a parenthesis and a three. Notice I don't have a parenthesis around the phosphate because there's only one phosphate. You only put parentheses around the substance that has more than one oxidation state. So, positive first, negative last, oxidation numbers add up to zero. When we're naming, name the positive, name the negative, the only time you have to worry about oxidation states is when it's a um, uh, transition metal and you have to figure it out and put it in Roman numerals. When you're writing the formulas, just crisscross, just make everything balanced, but always make sure it's the simplest formula, the, the smallest ratio. Okay? Well, I hope we'll, we'll do practice of these on Monday uh, more. Uh, we only have um, binary covalent molecular substances, and that's going to take me like five to ten minutes to do, and then we do acid. So I'm going to finish up on Monday. We'll practice on Tuesday, and you'll probably have some kind of quiz on Thursday. So uh, just know that that's coming. Hope you have a great weekend, and feel free to subscribe to my channel. Have a good day.